Let's pray. Lord, indeed you are holy forever. You are holy, holy, holy. You are awesome, majestic. And we praise you, we worship you, and you alone. You created us, and you saved us in Christ Jesus. And it's because of Christ, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we cry out to you and we say, holy, 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 holy forever. You are the only true God. And we're grateful that we can come to worship you, Lord, to come together to praise the name of Christ. Lord, I pray that you bless us this morning as we continue to worship you now through the preaching of the word. Father, I pray that I will be faithful to you as I come to Matthew 6, to the topic of anxiety. I pray, Father, that I will be faithful as I preach this passage, but I will also do it with the tenderness of Christ with the sweetness of Christ. And I pray that you will speak through me, that you will convict us, help us, challenge us, change us, give us freedom, give us victory, be with us. Thank you for your grace. In Christ we pray, amen. You might be seated. If you have a Bible, please go through the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. Before we go there, Matthew chapter 6, uh, I want to acknowledge two groups, friends. This week, on Monday, I spent half of the day meeting with 12 Brazilian pastors. They came to visit because they wanted to know more about ministry, learn some ideas, and it was a sweet fellowship, and they're worshiping with us here. Pastor from Brazil, can you please stand? We say welcome to you. Thank you. It's great to have you here. They are from Mina, the state of Mina in Brazil. Thank you, brothers, to be with us this morning. Also, I'm so excited to... We have a lot of our girls right here. This girl... <laughs> this weekend, we have our girls' weekend. Ms. Kim led them, and we have 200 people worshiping, serving together this weekend, and 14 homes that hosted them. If you are one of those 14 homes, we want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> girls, can you stand up so that they will see you? If you served in Girls Weekend and you were part of Girl, Girls Weekend, can you stand up, please? <laughs> the theme was the glory and the majesty of God. And I'm grateful for our student ministry scheme, how they always preach the truth of the gospel and have always pointing people to the majesty, the glory, and the beauty of our Lord. So we're grateful for you, and we pray that you will be blessed this weekend, and the fruit of this weekend we will see them in the weeks and the days ahead. Matthew 6. So if you're visiting with us, welcome. Uh, we normally walk through books of the Bible. We have been walking through the book of Matthew for some time now. We're in chapter 6. Chapter 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters is what is called the Sermon on the Mount. So those three chapters was a message that Christ preached to his disciples and the crowd. It took Jesus maybe 90 minutes to preach the Sermon on the Mount. It's taking us six months to do it. <laughs> but it's so good. Uh, so today we are in chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. If you do not have a Bible, uh, you can use one of the Bibles in front of you in the pews. And you can use that Bible. If you don't know where Matthew 6 is, it's fine. You will find it, one of those Bibles, in page 811. 811, you will find Matthew 6. And when I say verses, I mean the small numbers that we see in the pages of the Bible. So let's stand together as we read Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew 
Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what, we, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown, thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore... Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, they seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So every week, as I read the passage, I will give you what is the main thought, the main idea, kind of one sentence. So today I don't have a one sentence. Uh, that because the idea... The main thought of the sermon is the title of the sermon, Do Not Be Anxious. It's very straightforward. In fact, when you see the structure of the passage, there's a repetition at the beginning of the passage, at the, in the middle of the passage, and then at the end of the passage. So see with me in verse 25, and I'll put it right here. Verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Verse 31, the same. Therefore, do not be anxious. Verse 34, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. So that is the, the structure is telling us that the point that the Lord is driving home, so to speak, is do not be anxious. But he begins with therefore. He's making an argument. He's connecting this with what came before. For this reason, so this. So as we were here last week and we saw, he was talking about money and earthly possessions. He was telling us that whatever we treasure will master us. Earthly treasures, they don't last. They take over our heart. They damage our vision. They master us. They control us. And ultimately, now, therefore, they will strangle you with anxiety. Earthly treasures. And that's what we read in verse 24. In verse 24, which was last week, he said, you cannot serve God and money. Therefore, do not be anxious. So that's the argument that Christ is making here. But it's also, I read this passage maybe, I don't know, 50 times this week. And I read it in several languages, and, and I used different translations also, even paraphrases of the Bible. And as I read this passage over and over, I saw the tone of the passage. So Christ, when he's addressing his disciples, he's not speaking here like an angry judge or a coach that is scolding his players, he's speaking here with tenderness, compassion, and grace. He is, he says, do not be anxious. It's a command, do not be anxious. But it's not an angry rebuke. 
is with care and compassion. This passage is more like a bomb on a wound than a weapon to destroy. It's not used to destroy people, but to heal them. Do not be anxious. And of course, when the topic of anxiety comes up, there's a lot of ideas and discussions. There's a lot of thought. For example, people will talk about, when, when we talk about this, the issue of, of uh, the body, the biology, uh, the neurotransmitters, all of those pathways into the brains, all of those kind of things, chemical imbalances, all of that. This I would say, the Lord speaks about anxiety, but this passage is not all. This is not everything he says about anxiety. So today, I'll be addressing this specific passage. The topic of anxiety is addressed in Philippians 4. 1 Peter 5 speaks about anxiety. The Psalms, they also speak about anxiety. So I will not be able to cover everything that the Bible says about the topic. Today I'm addressing and unpacking Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. This is a very complex issue. And there are a lot of people, Christians, who are struggling with, with anxiety. And there are also Christians who struggle with mental illness. If you're struggling, there are a lot of people who would love to help you. We would love to help you. Do not struggle alone. But it's also important to make a distinction between fear and anxiety. Because people tend to confuse the, the, the two. So I was reading a book, and the author makes a distinction between fear and anxiety. And this is how he illustrated the topic. Fear, let's say, if you go driving to the airport, you're going to Tampa International, you take an airplane 10 minutes into the flight, the airplane is shaking, and the pilot announces there's a mechanical problem. We need to go back to Tampa. That's fear. You should be concerned about it. Anxiety is a little bit different. For example, tomorrow I'm taking an airplane. And to this afternoon, I fly tomorrow. Okay, what about if we, there's a bad weather? And what about if there's a storm? And what about if something happens? What about if the pilot is not really good? What about if we crash? So I'm developing all this thought in my mind about what could happen. And all the problems that we could face tomorrow as we fly. That is anxiety. So there's a distinction that is helpful to keep between fear and anxiety. Because the Bible teaches about both of them. And the Lord, of course, is not minimizing the hardship and the trouble of life. I mean, I will tell you, this is also kind of personal. This week, I was, I was at home, uh, the dining table. I, I was reading a book. And my daughter comes to me. And she says to me, Papi, can I ask you a question? Can we talk? I said, of course. So I take the book, and I close the book, and I say, what do you want to talk about? And then she says to me, what are you reading? I said, well, I'm reading a book about anxiety. I said, hmm, why are you reading about anxiety? Said, well, because I'm preaching on the topic, and I wanted to read a couple of books on the subject. And then, hmm, you can use me as an example, she said. <laughs> she's, t she's 10. I said, uh, what, what do you mean by that? I said, well, I'm an anxious person. He said, okay. I said, let me give you an example. And then she says, get your laptop, and you can type that, and you can tell that to them. <laughs> I said, okay. And she said, when I'm playing soccer on Saturdays, on Saturday morning, the night before, I almost get sick every week. I cannot eat breakfast before the game because I think if I eat breakfast, it will come out and I'm sweating 
and I'm so concerned and fear, afraid that I will not be able to kick the ball, or I will, I will make a mistake, or perhaps my team will lose because of my, me, and I'm sweating, and then I'm hungry because I didn't eat breakfast. <laughs> I'm a very anxious person, she says to me. I don't think I knew anxious that word when I was 10. <laughs> and I said, who told you that? Who said to you that you were an anxious person? No one. I just know. And I said, I think you perhaps struggle with anxiety. But that anxiety should not define you. You are not an anxious person. You struggle perhaps with anxiety. But your identity should not be in a struggle, in an emotion, but in Christ Jesus who made you. And I said, you know, the Bible also tells us that Christ can give us victory over anxiety. And she says to me, no way. I don't think I can get rid of this anxiety. <laughs> and I said, well, with Christ, it's possible. And the reason he's commanding his disciples, do not be anxious, it is because it is possible for us to be free of anxiety. I'm praying that she's convinced about that. So, if I'm addressing the topic of anxiety, I, I want to use a definition because the topic is so broad. This is the way I'm using the topic of anxiety in the context of Matthew 6. This is a definition that I have. It is the emotion of having fears of an unknown or anticipated future that disrupts the possibility of peace, rest, and joy in the present. Is the emotion of having fears of an unknown or anticipating a future that is disrupting the possibility today of me having peace, rest, and joy. So that is how I'm using anxiety in the context of Matthew 6. It's an emotion. But I want us to see the mercy of Christ addressing us here. Because anxiety only increases our suffering. So what I would like to do is to draw three points as we walk through these verses. First, we will see verses 25 through 27 then verses 28 through 32, and then verses 33 and 34. Number one, anxiety is fruitless. Trust your whole life to your heavenly Father, for He cares for you. Anxiety is fruitless. Trust your whole life to your heavenly Father, for He cares for you. As we see, read with me verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And then he says, he, ask, he is asking a question. Is it not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So Christ is giving us a command not to be anxious, and then he's giving us the logic, the reason why sh we should not be anxious. He's giving here what in, in philosophy is known as the from the lesser to the greater argument. It's a way in philosophy that people will argue. They will say they go from the lesser to the greater. For example, when he says, look at the birds. I said, what about you? You have more value than them. So think about this. Christ is addressing his disciples and the crowd, and he is speaking to them in a place like this. This is where people think the Sermon on the Mount took place. Something like that. It's like a hill. It's not like a big mountain top. And he's speaking to them, and he's sitting while he's addressing them. He's seated, and they're just listening to the Lord. And he's using illustrations from, from the nature, from nature. He said, think about the birds. That beautiful bird over there is not working, does not have a barn, he's not saving food, and God is feeding them. 
he feeds them. But you see, he says, your heavenly father feeds them. That's the language he's using. He doesn't say that is their heavenly father because those birds are the creation of God, but they are not children of God. Only the disciples of Christ are children of God. And there's in, let me make a parenthesis here. Some people think, well, we all are God's children. Well, no, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we are all God's creation. He created all people, but only those who have trusted, who have believed in Jesus are God's children. Those who received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. So Christ says, your heavenly father. If your heavenly father, who is your father, not their father, cares for them, how much more would he not care for you? He's making a logical argument. He says he loves you. He's concerned about you. God values you. He's the heavenly father, the good father. You have value and dignity. You are beautiful. God cares about you. And I will say this, especially to students, sometimes you are not happy with your body. And you struggle and you have anxieties with your, because of your body. God created you. You are beautiful and you have value. Do not allow the world, Hollywood, to tell you what is beautiful. God made you. And you have value and dignity and worth. And that is the point that Christ is making. If he cares, provides for those birds, he will do that for you. But some of us will say, well, you know, when he says, do not be anxious about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear, well, I don't struggle with that. And perhaps that's true for most of us. We don't have just one item that we will eat today. We have a pantry. We don't go home and say, oh, no, I don't think I will have anything to eat tomorrow. We have a lot of food to eat. We don't have just one item that we will wear. We have a closet. Our struggle today is not like, what, am I going to eat tomorrow? No, the question that we are asking ourselves, what kind of food are we going to eat tomorrow? Chinese, Mexican, Cuban, Southern food? That's the kind of question that we are asking ourselves most of the time. And some of you are like, oh, can I use that dress? Well, I, I think I used it recently, and people saw me with that one. Maybe I should not use that one again. But that's not the case for the disciples here. They don't have enough food they don't have enough drinks. So Christ is contextualizing to them because that's the need that they have. But if you say, well, I don't struggle with those three, I'm good. Well, he says, is not life more, about, more than food than body and clothing? Life. When he says life, everything is included. For example, some of you are asking, am I going to find a spouse or am I going to be single the rest of my life? And you're anxious about it. Would I be able to pay the rent next month? And you're anxious about it. I lost my job. Are we going to become homeless? And you're anxious about it. Would I be able to afford health care? 
Will I be able to keep my children safe? I'm anxious about it. Life is more than food. It's more than dating. It's more than clothing. It's more than health. The Lord is inviting us to put our complete trust in him. He who created us is able to protect us, to sustain us, and to provide for every need that we may have. And he is our father. But then he says, verse 27, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Meaning, anxiety is fruitless. It's unproductive. You cannot accomplish anything by being anxious. Disciples are invited to consider the foolishness of anxiety when anxiety can do nothing to improve one's security. Spurgeon, who was a pastor in London, he used to say this, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. It would not help you it will only affect you. Anxiety about our life is pointless, fruitless, unproductive. We cannot add a year, a month, a week, a day, even a second by being anxious. Anxiety will affect the quality of our life. A person's survival depends on the divine sovereignty, not on human anxiety. My friend uh, James Merritt, he's a pastor in Georgia. He, put it, he says this way. He's, this is how he puts it. Anxiety never solved a problem, never dried a tear, never lifted a burden, never removed an obstacle. It never made bad things good or good things better. Is fruitless, is unproductive. My question is if we cannot add even a minute to our lives, why do we think things like protecting our children, getting good jobs, ending a war, making our neighborhood safe will be accomplished by us being anxious? Those are good things, but none of them can be addressed by anxiety. And of course, when we read this, it's not that we should not plan, that we should not be strategic about the future, that we should not save money. It's none of that. The Bible encourages us to make plans for the future, to be diligent, to save, to be wise. So I'm not saying that you should not be concerned about your responsibilities. The point is that there's a difference between being responsible as an act of worship and being anxious about the outcome of our labors. I mean, think about the Lord Jesus. He was always busy doing the work of the Father. But Christ was not freaking out about what was happening next day. So we need to be responsible, but at the same time, we need to trust our Lord who cares for us. Number two, anxiety is faithless. Pray to God to help you to trust his power and goodness. Anxiety is faithless. Pray to God to help you to trust his power and goodness. The creator serves his creation. Read with me verse 28 and 29. It says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And then he says, 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, oven will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Then he says in verse 32, For the Gentiles, they seek after all these things. What is he doing here? He's sitting on the hill, and he's addressing them, and he sees a lily, one of the flowers, which are typical in, in that region in Israel. And he says, look at that flower. It's beautiful. God made that flower. You are more beautiful than the flower. God created you. And if God is dressing that flower, he will provide and he will care for you. That is the point that he's making. God is not only a farmer that is providing the food. He's also a tailor who is dressing us. He created food, but he also created beauty. And he's not too busy to be bothered by you. The living God lavishes every wild flower but he will also do that to you. He's not only the creator of basic things, he's also the creator of beautiful things. But then he says, all you of little faith, and then he says, the Gentiles, in verse 32, well, the Gentiles, that's a code language for unbelievers. Remember, the audience here is a Jewish audience. That he's addressing. The Gentiles were the pagans, those who knew nothing about God. And he said, When you are anxious, you are not trusting me and you're acting like a Gentile. Anxiety could be a sign that we don't know him well or that we don't trust him. He says, Sign of functional atheism, atheism. We, we, we think that God is, is not there, that God does not care, or that He's not powerful enough to be trusted. But that's the case for the Gentiles, not for the disciples of Christ. Elise Fitzpatrick, who had, has it, wrote a book on the subject, she says, Your anxiety is a road sign pointing to a deeper problem, unbelief. All you of little faith. Our anxiety is rooted in doubt about God's character. It's questioning his fatherly care, his provision. When I'm anxious about what's going on to happen to my life, what I'm really saying is, and I quote, God, you cannot handle this. You are either too weak or you are, not, you are not interested. You are unloving. You are not smart enough to take care of my life. I have devoted all my attention to solve this situation on my own. Of course, we, normally we, we would not say that, but that's how we acting. When we become anxious, we're acting like orphans. We are forgetting that in Christ, God is our Father, a good Father, a gracious Father. He gave us the best gift. Think about Romans 8, 31, 32. This is what he says. What, shall, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God gave us his eternal son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to, come to rescue us, to save us, to give us life, if he gave us the best gift, don't you think that he will care and provide and sustain you? He will do it. 
But it makes sense for those who do not know God to spend their lives being anxious, but not for those who are in Christ. And one of the reasons we want to accumulate a lot of material possessions is because we do not want to be anxious about the future. We think that if I have enough stuff, I will be secure. And the Lord is telling us, the more you have, the more anxious you will be. Because the solution is not having more, but having the right trust, the right devotion, the right treasure. Some of you, for example, the two of you, husband and wife, you've been married for, let's say, 20 years. 20 years ago, when you came together in marriage, you had nothing. You were struggling. Today, 20 years after, you have way more. But why today you are more anxious than 20 years ago when you had nothing? 20 years ago, you had nothing. Today, you have plenty. And yet, today, you are more anxious. Perhaps we are not trusting God the way the Bible is encouraging us to trust God. I remember some time ago, I was talking with my wife. This is not on my notes, so I might get in trouble. Uh, and she said to me, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking, sometimes I'm even anxious about something happens to you. You know, like, what about if you are not here? You know, pro who will protect us to provide for us? And I say, wait, 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 wait. That thought assumes two things. That I'm the one sustaining us. And second, that I can do it better than God. But the one who sustains us is the Lord. The one who protects us is God. The one who provides for us is our Heavenly Father. He is the one protecting us. He is the one sustaining us. And He is the one holding us fast. Trust the Lord. Always put your trust in God alone. Number three. Verses 33 and 34. And he says, number three, this is the point. Do not suffer a pain that may never come. Seek God and trust his care and his provision. Do not suffer a pain that may never come. Seek God and trust his care and provision. Read with me verses 33 and 34. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, some Christians trust God with their eternal future but not with the next week. Is that true? We say, Lord, we have trusted you. We know that we are with you and will be with you forever. I know that for the next 10,000 years, I will be with you because I'm secure. But I cannot trust you for tomorrow and next week. That's what we say. We are so anxious about the next few days when we're trusting God for eternity. I would trust you my salvation, but I would not trust you my son or my daughter. Trust and devote your whole life to God. And you see, he says, your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. That's what he says in verse 33. 
In verse 32, he says, Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God is not a detached, disconnected, distant God. He's personal and near. I have a friend. Uh, he's a pastor, but he grew up without his father. His father abandoned him when he was, I don't know, little boy, maybe three years old. So, and his father, his earthly father, was not very responsible. He would not visit him. He would come once a year, and he would stop by the house to talk with him. So my friend did not have a relationship with his father. And he said once, he will come, his early, earthly father, he will come to my house trying to make it up for being away for a year. And he will ask me, what do you want? What do you need? Let's go to Walmart, one of those places. And let's, what do you need? I said, what do you need? And he said, every time he asked that question, I was hurt. Why? Because he was reminding me that he doesn't know me, that he doesn't know what I need because he's not with me. That's not the case with our Heavenly Father. He knows us and he knows our needs. Our Heavenly Father is a good, faithful Father. He knows what we need even before we know that we need it. God knows better what we need. Sometimes we think we need something, but it's the opposite of that that we really need. God knows what we need. Brothers and sisters, trust God's care and provision. Do not suffer for a pain that may never come. Anxiety is to suffer a future that might never come. Faith demands that we trust God to provide and to sustain us today and tomorrow. You cannot do anything about what might happen tomorrow. But you need to know that the tomorrow is in God's hands. He has control. We cannot get the eyes of the Father tomorrow, for tomorrow is a promise, not a possession. But He gives us grace today. And I will say this, God will not give you today the grace for the pains that may never come. And I see this happening all the time. Pastor, I will finish USF next semester. I'm not sure that we'll be able to get a job. I mean, no one gets a job six months ahead of time, most of the cases. But the point here is trust God. Sometimes we anticipate a pain and we suffer the pain today and perhaps that pain will never come. But we are already affecting drained, exhausted for the pain that may never come. God promised to give us grace for today, not for tomorrow. Tomorrow, he will give us the grace for tomorrow. This is what the Bible says in the book of Lamentations. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning, his mercies are new. He will give us daily the bread that we need. But do not anticipate troubles that may never come. Because God did not promise to give you grace for those. Sometimes we find ourselves looking to the future. And then imagine troubles in the future. And I wonder what's going to happen. I was listening to uh, a person, and his son was coughing. So, <coughs> and he said, oh, 
he might get an ear infection, strep throat, and a high fever. I said, whoa, how do you get there? He just was coughing. And now you're anticipating ear infection, strep throat, and fever? Let's not go there. It is unhealthy, fruitless, faithless. Trust the Lord. Some of you today, this week, received the news that you need to get an MRI next week. And you don't know what the result of that MRI will tell you. Some of you are waiting for an appointment at Moffitt. And you don't know what the doctors will say. Some of you are waiting to get the letter from the university that you want to attend. Some of you are, are wondering if you will ever be able to get married. Some of you are wondering if you will ever be able to get a job. I tell you, trust the Lord today. Rest on his kindness and his, on his faithfulness, on his love for you. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Trust the Lord today to keep you, to sustain you. He is faithful. He is good. And he is all powerful. Trust the Lord. Do not, do not suffer the pains that may never come. Uh, Curry uh, Ten Boon has this quote, and it's so helpful, and this is what she says. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Brothers and sisters, God knows you. We know him. He is with us. He is faithful. Trust the unknown future to our heavenly, well-known Father. Trust the Lord. Do not waste your suffering with anxiety. Trust the Lord today. To conclude, I was thinking about this, and this is something that I heard from uh, Brad Hambrick. He's a counseling professor. And his illustration that he uses, and I think is the spirit of this passage, Christ is addressing us with such a tenderness here, with such a compassion, that it's almost like, let's think about this. We go to a restaurant, and you are there, I say, I'm there with two children, maybe five and seven. And my wife is with me. And we're eating at the restaurant, and we are around the table. And someone, maybe a few tables next to us, is screaming and yelling at the waitress. And he's hitting the table, and we think that something is going to happen. And we look at her, and the children, they're afraid. They come closer to me. And they are like just afraid. If I say to them, do not worry, do not be anxious. People like that, they do an spectacle of themselves. And after a few moments, they will just walk out of the restaurant and everything will be fine and will be able to eat the food. It's fine. If I say that to them, and I bring them closer to me, they will be fine. And that is the tone of the speech of Christ here. I know you're struggling. I know there are fears. Do not be anxious. Come, draw near, 
be with me because your heavenly Father cares for you. Brothers and sisters, do not be anxious about life or about the future. Trust your heavenly Father. If you are here and you're not a Christian, it makes sense for you to be anxious. Because that is what Christ says people without God will do. But that should not be the case. Your biggest problem, in fact, actually, is not anxiety, but it's unbelief. Because you don't have God as Father. So if you're here and you do not have a relationship with Christ, I invite you to come to Him, to trust Him, to put your faith in Christ. And in Christ, God will receive you as His son or as His daughter. Come to Jesus. In a moment, we will pray. Pastors will be in the front. We will sing praises to the Lord. If you have questions, about what it means to be saved, to trust God, we would love to talk with you. Trust Jesus. Stand together as we pray. Father, we praise you for your grace and mercy. Father, I pray that we would not be anxious, that we will cast our anxieties on you because you care for us. Help us to trust you to rest on you. And I pray for those who are here who do not know you. Father, I pray that you would draw them to yourself and they would trust Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Father, draw them near. Draw them to yourself and save them, we ask you. Thank you for your grace, your compassion, your mercy and love. In Christ we pray. Amen. James, Pastor David. Sing this together, church. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my love thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well.
as we walk out of this room. Receive this word from the letter of Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep us, to keep you from falling, from stumbling, and to present you blameless, perfect, righteous, before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to him be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen.